Okay, this is our fifth video about monolithic versus layered. We're still talking about monolithic uh, prosthesis. We discussed uh, many different monolithic prosthesis. And now we're going to talk about handling the monolithic prosthesis and proceed to a layered prosthesis. And then after that, the comparison between layered and monolithic. And then my own technique of monolayered and then show many cases of different techniques and, you know, discuss uh, cons and pros of both uh, techniques. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about alloy monolithic handling tips. There isn't much to say about it, but casting tips, you know, use different crucibles for different alloys because some people are still just not doing that, especially when it comes to semi-precious and precious. I still use different crucibles for uh, gold than the, uh, the silver palladium or the semi-precious. Uh, it's not costly, you just have different crucibles for different alloys and then uh, you will control contamination this way. Wind the casting machine are more times when casting non-precious alloys. This is for the people who cast with the conventional uh, centrifuge casting machine like myself. And less times uh, as you use higher content precious alloys. Now dental alloys vary from non-precious nickel per uh, beryllium to the highest gold continent. Nickel chromium alloys are popular around the world but are effectively banned in Sweden, for example, since nickel is known to cause contact dermatitis. It's not really just about the contact dermatitis that nickel causes, but uh, you shouldn't be uh, inhaling uh, nickel or beryllium uh, either. All right? So. Uh, Technicians and dentists must avoid inhaling nickel chromium fumes or grinding dust, especially if the alloy contains beryllium. Beryllium is toxic, and then uh, even nickel, because you know many many technicians kind of kind of careless about this. Dentists by nature they were you know um, they were mask faces, uh, face masks, and they were uh, the you know uh, gloves. And, and everything but us in the dental lab we kind of uh, overlook these things um, even though we're the one who grind grinding dust is, is, uh, is mostly in the lab so you should take this into consideration especially if you use uh, nickel chromium alloys in my lab I only use nickel free uh, non-precious and I don't use that much non-precious anyway but w when I get an non-precious case uh, I only use uh, nickel free, beryllium free, uh, non precious. And it's uh, almost double uh, the money to buy uh, nickel free. Uh, it's cheaper, it's almost half the price to buy uh, a non precious with nickel. Alright, nickel chromium uh, alloy. But, anyways, I'm just used to nickel free, that's all I use. And I think it's justified, and you know, uh, I think when you go. Unprecious, you should consider going uh, nickel free. Now, we use a different set of wares and finishers, uh, should be used for each type of framework. And you should, you know, finish your framework one, one side to the other, not going back and forth, back and forth, because that will create micro folds that will, uh, you know, trap uh, contamination inside of it. Okay. Mirror image finishing, like we said. Uh, now, mirror image finishing is uh, preferred for all kinds of alloys, except for titanium alloys. Do, uh, it's not recommended to uh, puff finished. Actually, when I read uh, this study, I didn't quite understand what do they mean by puff finished. But I figured that when you deal with titanium, say that you have a titanium abutment, and you adjusted the neck of that titanium abutment a little bit, then it's recommended that you do the rubber sequence on uh, on finishing that uh, part that you touched with a bear or with a green stone or whatever. So you do the rubber sequence of making it, you know, uh, making it polished, but you do not use the puff, the polishers, you know, uh, the high polish. Uh, for some reason, it tends to uh, uh, it tends to uh, uh, make the titanium uh, more uh, susceptible to uh, corrosion 
All right. Now send that back. Who does PFMs anymore? Well, many people still do PFMs in this region of the world here in the state of Qatar in the Middle East where I uh, work. Uh, we rarely use any PFMs, honestly. PFMs are less than 10% of my work. Most of my work is zirconia and lithium disilicates. Uh, and we will discuss that in details. But in this, this state, uh, it's not heavily populated. We're only 2 million in this country. Uh, and uh, it's one of the highest incomes in the world cause of gas and uh, natural gas and fuel and petroleum uh, that they have in this state so uh, we, we we rarely use any pfms and if we we're to use pfms we usually use uh, porcelain fused to silver palladium or porcelain fused to gold but even that we we, we don't use that much it's less than person it's not even 10 percent less than 10 percent of pfms that we have in the lab mostly are zirconia and lithium disilicates so what is this this is a pfm this is a porcelain fused to metal that i did once all right uh, now alloys like we said since we're talking about alloys and monolithics and handling tips of alloys let's just touch up on alloys so especially in this uh, part of the world people uh, are confused about alloys uh, these are different alloys full cast non-precious nickel free a silver palladium porcelain fused silver palladium porcelain fused to gold porcelain fused to 70% gold uh, this is the example that we gave before this is 88% gold this is 75% gold uh, monolithic number seven number six and five are pfm porcelain fused to gold pfgs that's the way they look this gram technology we stopped using that we used it before uh, as cores uh, galvanization all right now uh, just for people who don't know or don't use uh, high continent gold or precious alloys or noble or high noble alloys this is the, the classification real quick i took uh, jensen as a quick example jensen porcelain alloys you would notice that 40 percent and up gold regardless if it's white gold or yellow gold anything any continent of 40 percent and up would be considered high noble or precious high noble alloys all right less than that will be considered noble all the way down they don't have uh, non-precious jensen don't have non-precious so noble alloys is less than 40 percent all right now uh now this is the, this is the classification high noble noble and non-noble this classification people use and people use precious semi-precious and non-precious uh, all i want to point out here is that there is that that's high noble equals precious and then noble equals semi-precious and then non-noble is non-precious okay so that's why many people used to tell us that use the noble classification it's better because it's it's, it's high noble and then noble you know the noble is better than saying semi-precious because semi is a semi partially you know partially precious semi-precious so you're better off saying noble than saying semi-precious it just gives you know the illusion of being really noble you know <laughs> noble high noble non-noble or precious semi-precious and non-precious and all of these are porcelain alloys uh, cte uh, uh, is studied and applicated here so you can't use it with porcelain alloys now these are crown and bridge alloys you cannot uh, layer porcelain on top of them okay same thing it's many alloys i stopped buying uh, uh, crown and bridge alloys long time ago because i don't do much monolithic uh, golds or semi-precious anymore all right and there's the universal alloys but pretty much i buy from this chart i buy porcelain alloys because i want to apply porcelain on most of the alloys or most of the the, the 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 use of my metal or alloy is pfms and i rarely get full cast rarely and usually it's an unprecious full cast and then to do a bridge like this it has to be porcelain alloys because part of it is monolithic and part of it is layered 
so I want something that works for both so I buy from this chart you can buy from Universal you can buy for Crown and Bridge and save money just to do full cast if you still are doing a lot of full casts in the back in the, in the posterior region all right now these are, uh, are some of the alloys that I use from ginseng I use these four 88% uh, silver palladium 75% 40% gold all right from others I use uh, other things this is nickel free and I, I have now from uh, Argident, I have 52% gold, I think. And uh, I have a bunch of other alloys that I can't recall at the moment. I don't use them like I indicated before. I don't use them that much anymore. Handling tips for monolithic lithium disilicates or zirconia. Uh, it's the same handling tips, whether you, you're handling uh, lithium disilicates or zirconia when it comes to polishing and finishing and stuff like that. Except that zirconia is, uh, is more sensitive to heat and you have to use an aqua finisher for that. Now, where of enamel caused by opposing uh, metal free crowns? That was a study for Dr. Edward McLaren and others in 2014. The study says that zirconia has less wear than lithium disilicate. Where of the enamel opposing adjusted lithium disilicate and zirconia decreased following polishing? So a clinical significance of this is the clinical significance would be zirconia experiences less and lithium disilicate experiences equivalent occlusal wear as natural enamel. It is preferable, uh, preferable to polish zirconia and lithium disilicate after adjusting to make them wear compatible with enamel. In other words, once you do selective grinding or adjustment or, or occlusal adjustments to your crown or your bridge, you should perform uh, the sequence of polishing. Uh, like I said, uh, I know that uh, Shofu has the best polishing sequence out there. You know, it, it's, a, it's a conclusion of a study that I've read before I saved it somewhere, that, that Shofu has given the best uh, sequence of, of, of polishing when it comes to lithium disilicates and uh, zirconias. So pretty much occlusal adjustments you can send it back for glaze or just go ahead and do the polishing uh, of the occlusal surface this will uh, eliminate uh, this will uh, eliminate the wear of the uh, 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 the wear of adjacent uh, the wear of opposing enamel all right now since we're talking about handling too you see many many technicians sand plast inside of the lithium disilicates uh, actually there is no need all right and sand plasting the inside of lithium disilicate okay this is an emax cad for example sand plasting the inside of lithium disilicate will reduce uh, the strength of it okay fracture strength will be reduced by sand plasting uh, now sand plasting zirconia is a different subject too uh, many studies are against sand plasting inside of lithium disilicate or zirconia and uh, I've read a couple of papers for doctors in the US that do sand plast the inside of zirconia core or monolithic they do sand plast it with the with the side the, with the uh, chair side hand sand plaster they use 50 microns uh, particles and they sand on a very uh, minimum uh, PSI like uh, one PSI or half PSI okay so it's minimum uh, mechanical sand blasting for the inside of the zirconia and uh, they propose that this gives good mechanical better mechanical uh, cementation properties to the zirconia since uh, we have an issue of zirconia uh, cementation uh, now we're gonna like I said we're gonna discuss uh, etchable zirconia and like I said most studies are indicating that we should not sand blast uh, for, for uh, you know for the fear of uh, micro cracks we should not sand blast the inside of zirconia or the inside of lithium disilicate I just wanted to say that and when it comes to lithium disilicate we already itch the lithium disilicates prior to cementation so you have chem uh, you have chemical uh, you have chemical itching and, uh, and and you know I don't see any reason why would you send blast the inside of lithium disilicates anyway so since there is a study against it just 
I would advise that you don't do uh, sandblasting whether for zirconia or for lithium disilicate. If you want to go ahead and do it, just be very careful. Use 50 uh, uh, microns uh, of aluminum oxide particles and use very low uh, PSI pressure. All right. Now, the effect of zirconia surface architecturing technique on the zirconia veneer interfacial bond strength. In other words, itching the outside of the core before applying porcelain to it uh, have shown that uh, it in, it's improved by itching, okay? So, uh, in conclusion, uh, this test improves interfacial bond strength between zirconia and the veneering materials by increasing the surface roughness of zirconia, right? And we're going to talk about the itching of the inside of the zirconia and the effect of it uh, with the mechanical interlock with the, the uh, mechanical interlock of cements and why would people itch zirconia from inside but itching the outside the outer surface of zirconia you know uh, will give you a surface roughness of this zirconia and it will aid in the uh, interface inter interfacial bond uh, between zirconia and the veneering materials now, anything that has to do with surface roughness of zirconia, whether the, out, the outer surface or the inner surface of this core, uh, I think more studies should be performed and talk about this because there is always a fear of micro cracks in the zirconia uh, by roughening the surface, whether mechanically or uh, chemically and we will see we will discuss chemically later but even mechanically that's why they do not recommend sand plastic you know so there is a fear of micro cracks that would will grow in the future all right so that's why all of this is still under investigation now this is just uh, th these photos are courtesy of dr muhammad nabusi uh, this uh, uh, work that we did together uh, monolithic monolithic lithium disilicates all right monolithic zirconia in the back adjusted occlusally adjusted and then polished all right sequence of polishing same thing monolithic highly polished zirconia crowns uh, what are these you want to take a guess this is zirconia monolithic uh, this has zero porcelain on top of it. It's monolithic, fully monolithic zirconia. Uh, if I recall correctly, it was uh, pre-centered colored and then a little bit stained afterwards. But it's only stains and glaze. All right. Um, so those are monolithic zirconias. Monolithic are mostly manufactured by what's the ways of, of, of manufacturing all monolithics casting milling pressing and infusing i haven't uh, found much studies on infusing how, how is it work i think it used to uh, it could be a glidewell way of manufacturing uh, uh, prior to zirconia age or prior to zirconia evolution i think i don't know what's infusing but milling, pressing, and casting that we can recognize and we know. All right. Are feldspathic veneers considered monolithic or layered? It's just, you know, a question, but pretty much it's feldspathic. It's feldspathic. So if you say that they are uh, of one layer, you know, because you can bake it once and just glaze it, then it's monolithic. Or you can say, no, it's layered because we use... Uh, powder and liquid together and you layer one layer on top of the other it could be layered it doesn't really matter I just uh, put this question up just for brainstorming now uh, practically speaking should we glaze or polish monolithic prosthesis after occlusal adjustments you know, you know it's more practical as it's proven that it's less abrasive to the opposing to polish with a polishing sequence and it's less visits for the patient and it's uh, a quicker solution as well so practically speaking if you do occlusal adjustment and that doesn't include uh, the buckle surface by any chance then you can just go ahead and, and polish the occlusal surface it gives you uh, uh, 
it will eliminate the occlusal uh, wear, uh, the possibility of occlusal uh, wear of opposing, and then it's even better than glazing. All right. Now we will proceed to uh, layered uh, restorative materials or layered prosthesis. Uh, we finished monolithic. We talked about monolithic and monolithic uh, uh, kinds of classifications and monolithic handling tips. And we talked about, uh, we touched up about different stuff, monolithic abutments, uh, handling tips, uh, alloys classifications and all kind of stuff. Now we're gonna go into the second part of this long lecture which is layered prosthesis all right when we talk about layered prosthesis first we have to discuss the porcelain types or porcelain classification or ceramic classification however you want to call it ceramic classification there is many many classifications of ceramics all right now, this is the classification that i will discuss in details uh, first of all you know that ceramics or glasses are brittle and they fracture under very low strain. Uh, ceramics can be classified by their microstructure. All right. They can also be classified by the processing technique, powder liquid, pressed machine, and they can be uh, uh, in, in this study, uh, they were uh, broken down into four basic compositional categories with a few subcategories in category two. So this is the classification that I will be talking about in details, okay? I find that this is the, the very simple classification. There, there is other classifications. And like I said, you take the average of it. There's different classifications. I find that this will give you really the, the, the clear idea of uh, ceramic classification on a basic level, all right? There's four categories in this classification. There's composition category one, Category 2, Category 3, and Category 4. The composition Category 1, it's a glass-based system or mainly silica, all right? So it's a glass-based system, mainly silica. Composition Category 2 is still a glass-based system, mainly silica, but with fillers. Once you add fillers to it, it becomes a different composition category by itself, all right? Now, there is composition category 3, which is crystalline. Now, we're not talking about silica anymore. Now, we switch to crystalline. Crystalline-based systems with glass fillers, mainly alumina. Fourth is polycrystalline, the polycrystalline solids, alumina and zirconia. And details would be in next slides. Let's take them one at a time. Let's start with composition category 1, glass-based ceramics, mainly silica. No fillers, only silica. Those are like, remember the porcelain denture teeth? The porcelain denture teeth, the older way of doing porcelain denture teeth, that was uh, composition uh, category one. Category one is the powder liquid uh, virgin were made of the specific veneering of alumina based core system. Example, Inseram or Noble Procera. But not to be confused with the milled or infused uh, Noble Procera. We're talking about a powder and a liquid powder and liquid in ceram or powder and liquid noble procera those are of category one as well uh, now some people classify uh, vita vita blocks mark two the high continent porcelain that we talked about before the sericad camp systems uh, they uh, i mean the, the mark two vita block use with the ceric cad camp system the, the 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 one block that's milled that we talked about in the fourth category of uh, monolithics we said high glass continent and we gave mark two as an example this mark two some people consider it category one which is high glass continent of silica without fillers so this was category one okay now category two has three subcategories that's the only category that's, that has subcategories, which is category two. And we said that it's the same thing. It's high continent of silica, but with fillers. Now, these fillers could be, first, low to moderate lucite containing. And this is what's 
known as feldspathic porcelain example vm13 some people say vm92 okay so vm13 or vita uh, 13 feldspathic porcelain that's an example of low to moderate lucite containing that's subcategory one uh, of the category two now subcategory two let's call it 2.2 has high continent of lucite high lucite continent and this high uh, lucite continent approximately 50 percent this wa was developed in both powder liquid and machinable and it's called Empress One. That's the Empress One that came out from Evo Clar Vivident a uh, long time ago. So Empress One falls into category two, subcategory two, uh, category two and the subcategory two. So notice that subcategory one and two, these two subcategories are talking about lucite containing or, or lucite continent. The lucite continent, when it's low or moderate, it's subcategory one, like the Vita VM13, or you're talking about subcategory two, which is high lucite. An example of it is the machined or the powder liquid of Empress 2. All right. Now we come to subcategory three. It has a totally different filler. The first two has lucite filler. The third one has a lithium disilicate filler. So lithium disilicate glass ceramics is a new type of glass ceramic introduced by Evo Clar. Uh, Vivadent as IPS Empress 2, now called IPS Emax, and we said that Emax uh, doesn't really mean lithium disilicate for Evoclar Vivadent anymore because now they call the Zercad, they call it Emax Zercad. So zirconium blocks, they're called Emax Zercad, zirconium uh, CAD CAM blocks. So Emax is not uh, really, uh, people refer, uh, refer to lithium disilicate as Emax, but really it's not. Uh, a scientific term we should say lithium disilicate glass so category two with its three subcategories the first subcategory is low to moderate lucite containing the second subcategory is high lucite containing Empress one and the third subcategory doesn't have lucite it has lithium disilicate filler and it's Empress two all right so this is the subcategory two and this is important to know that feldspathic Empress 1, Empress 2 are of the same category, the same family. This is very important and we will discuss that in the following uh, slide. Now, if you look at this slide, this slide is, uh, this uh, photo is courtesy of Ayhan Farah CDT. He is a, a CDT with Evoclar Vivident, uh, technical, uh, uh, technical expert, all right? And he, he posted this. Look, this is a lithium disilicate Emax medium translucent ingot, fully pressed and stained. So pretty much monolithic. Monolithic lithium disilicate Emax empty. All right. While this is a feldspathic IPS inline stacked on refractory. So this is a feldspathic porcelain, feldspathic veneer. The difference between the two veneers, I want you to look at it even after cementation and everything look at it you, you you wouldn't see much of a difference yes i know that stacked uh, over refractory or layered or feldspathic gives you more translucency wherever you want your translucency more masking wherever you want masking because you control by the tip of the brush the amount of masking or the amount of translucency that you want i understand that so here is much of masking here and there and much of translucency wherever they want the translucency while here it's more of uh, homogeneous it's more of uh, one uh, pressed material monolithic yes you can change a little bit with the staining and with uh, you can do more masking with staining you can give illusions of translucency you can you can do things in the pressed lithium disilicates as well but yes i understand that feldspathic is more creative and gives you more details and you can characterize much more with feldspathic than you can with lithium disilicate but do not forget that this is around 500 megapascal of strength why this is about 90 megapascal of strength so we're talking about five folds five times more strength of this prosthesis than that more five times more of the lithium disilicate strength than it is for the refractory uh, feldspathic uh, veneers. 
So you don't want to overlook this too. So you have to think about more than one factor. You have to think about masking, about translucency, about cementation. Cementation, they're the same family. They're both itchable, okay? So you can itch both and you can bond both in the same way. So you're talking th th that factor is pretty much, you know, set. But the other factors, you're talking about translucency, masking and everything, and, or, or minimum preparation too. People say that, oh, field spathic, you can build, uh, build a field spathic of 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Well, you can press 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. I will show some some of the, my work too. Uh, yes, it's hard to go less than 0 0.2 and uh, in, in, in fully pressed, of course. But you're talking about the same range, you know, a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 difference in thickness. It does make a difference in certain cases, but I want you to, to keep in mind the difference in strength and the difference in other factors altogether as a package and think of it of what is the best prosthesis to be used in this case uh, based on mechanical properties translucency and uh, cementation all right so there's more than one factor to think about when you want to choose as a team between a dentist and a dental lab technician what to use and how to fabricate this uh, specific uh, prosthesis for this specific case so we talked about category two the family of category four, subcategory one and two and three, which is uh, low to moderate uh, low site containing, high low site containing, and lithium disilicate. And we said it's one family of category two, which is high uh, silica continent with fillers. So number one with uh, category number one was, uh, was high continent of silica with no fillers. Category number two was high continent uh, silica with fillers, the fillers were lucite in both subcategory 1 and 2 with different continent and then lithium disilicate in category 3 but they are the same family. Now we come to family 3, composition category 3. Category 3 is crystalline. Now we don't talk about we don't talk about lucite or lithium disilicate anymore or silica. We're talking about totally different material which is crystalline. Crystalline based systems with glass fillers. Yes, there is glass fillers, mainly alumina but the cluster is crystalline, crystalline based systems. Now this is the Enseram alumina or Enseram spinel. Or Procera but the solid centered alumina, not the category one powder liquid. Remember we said Procera comes in powder and liquid uh, and that's category one, uh, composition high in, in, uh, in silica with no fillers. But this is the, the solid centered alumina, the Procera product. Uh, and it's not a powder liquid uh, form, it's a solid centered alumina, okay? Procera, category three. And you know that Procera, all ceram uh, combination of strength and beauty has helped distinguish Nobel BioCare, as we know, that was the booming of Nobel BioCare back in the day, as a leader in tooth color restoration. Since 1983, millions of dental patients have been treated with Procera worldwide. So Procera, is a product of the category 3 composition category 3 which is crystalline based systems with alumina all right with fillers mainly alumina and then there is the fourth uh, category which is uh, polycrystalline all right mostly alumina or zirconia the example of it is zirconia we talked about zirconia uh, in details so we don't need to repeat that now there is tips about this category uh, these tips are mainly taken from uh, from Dr. Edward McLaren's uh, uh, notes on the classification, if I'm not mistaken, and others, but mostly Dr. Uh, Edward McLaren. So, category 1 and 2 are etchable because they have silica, right? Category 1, high silica. Category 2, high in silica with fillers. They're both etchable. Lithium disilicate, lucite, Empress 1, Empress 2. Uh, feldspathic they're all itchable category one and two are itchable crystalline based systems uh, category one and two are itchable because they're glass based systems now the crystalline based systems category three and four are not itchable but thus much more difficult to bond all right it's difficult to bond category three and four now we're going to discuss if zircon is itchable or not later like, like we said categories one through three can exist in powder form, all right? Powder liquid form. Category one, the silica, and category uh, two, silica with fillers, and category 
3 which is Coursera can exist in powder form as well uh, that's then fabricated using a wet brush technique or they can also be pre uh, processed into a block form that can be pressed or machined right ingots we can press the ingots or we can CAD CAM or mill the blocks of these one through three categories now as a general rule, powder liquid system have much lower strength, of course, like we said, like the feldspathic stacked porcelain over refractory or over uh, platinum foil, tin foil, uh, than pre-manufactured blocks because of a much larger amount of bubbles and flaws in the finished restoration. Of course, powder liquid systems are lower, uh, have much lower strength. Uh, now you're gonna find uh, many classifications like i uh, pointed out before so let's look at this this is a different classification i don't want to confuse you that's why i put the simple uh, easy to remember classification in the beginning but it doesn't hurt to look at this all right there's the matrix the filler the process the trademark uh, now we're, we're saying that this is like the high uh, the high silica continent See aesthetic ceramic, veneering ceramic, uh, powder, powder, VM7. Uh, there is no pressed. It's only powdered, this first category here. Zirconia ceramics. Zirconia ceramics can be powder and can be uh, pressed. Uh, alumino, uh, alumino silicate glass, they call it. Okay, moderate lucite. A ceramic uh, containing 5 to 10% lucite. Okay, it can be powdered or pressed. Pressed like the IPS Emacs Zerpress, for example, Vita VM13 powder for that category, metal ceramic, higher lucite, 17 to 25% lucite, powder and pressed. It's VM13, and there's inline uh, press over metal, there's VM, uh, VM PM9 from Vita. Then you're talking about different fillers here. Ceric Mark II, it's, uh, it's a category by itself, it's high in, in, uh, in ceramics. Okay, there is lucite 14 to 50 percent, and now we're talking about uh, Impress Aesthetic, which is Impress One. Okay, Procad, Optic, Serenate, uh, My Rage. I don't know what that is, but Serenate I know. Okay, so powder and pressable when it comes to lucite 40 to 50 percent. There is lithium disilicates now, low glass continent, but high in lithium disilicates 70 percent, and now we're talking about Emax CAD and Emax Press. Over here, we're talking about al alumina spinel. Alumina zirconia 70%, talking about Inseram alumina, Inseram spinel, and zirconia. Uh, no glass continent, which is polycrystallines, not crystallines, but polycrystallines. There is polycrystalline of alumina and polycrystalline of zirconia, deuterium stabilized zirconia with its uh, brand names, and then Vita All Pure Procera. Okay, so this is a different classification. You, you may look at it and, and see uh, what's going on here, too. but I like the first classification, it's pretty simple. Now handling tips for PFMs, layered glass ceramics and layered Procera in Ceram and layered Zirconia. Because anything layered, end of the day it's layered with porcelain uh, and mostly, uh, not mostly, but so, some of it is uh, low, uh, low temperature porcelain, some of it is high temperature porcelain, but the end of the day it's porcelain and mostly it's uh, synthetic porcelains. So handling tips would be handling tips for porcelain, whether this porcelain is layered on top of glass ceramics or on top of Inseram or on top of Procera or on top of Zirconia. Because even from different companies like CM or, uh, or Evoclar Vibident, it's the same porcelain that you apply on top of Zirconia or on top of lithium disilicate. It's the same temperatures almost and the same, it is the same temperatures and the same uh, porcelain that's applied on top of that core so it, it would be the same handling tips for that outer layer of porcelain now there are many studies in all directions but this is the strongest belief that at least parts of the prosthesis in contact with opposing dentition uh, must be polished or reglazed after occlusal adjustment okay we established that already uh, high rate of wear decreased over time suggesting that the effect of surface roughness on wear may be self-limiting. Now, this is a study by uh, Monsky and Taylor, and it, it, it suggests that 
even if you have a word to the opposing with time this word of opposing will will affect the opposing and the prosthesis itself and it will limit itself like after a while it won't do any uh, any uh, uh, surface wear for the opposing anyway so it's it's a time limiting uh, it's a self limiting uh, uh, phenomena so after after a while there is no wear but the question is how much wear is it gonna do how much damage is it gonna do or is it gonna do much of a damage before it limit itself or not in other words why wouldn't you polish after cruisal adjustment or reglaze that's your best that's the, that's your top best uh, uh, the, the best thing to do all right polish then if not glaze but don't leave it you know for wearing uh, the opposing and assuming that you know it will limit itself after a while well we don't know how much we don't have a study to show how much damage it will do for the opposing before it limits itself but it's at least it's good to know that it's you know a self uh, limiting uh, process now uh, results of many studies confirm that chipping is the first cause of zirconia based uh, prosthesis failures of course zirconia layer prosthesis chipping failures can be reduced by taking into account several risk parameters such as the presence of ceramic restoration as a antagonist all right the presence of parafunctional activities of course you have to do your selective grinding and make sure that there is no premature contacts and all kind of stuff the presence of implants as as support so the base is implant like a, like a, a zirconia crown on top of an implant all right of course the use of occlusal night guard can also decrease failure uh, rates uh, now these are only you know uh, considerations of, uh, of of chipping why does it happen what could uh, uh, what could uh, what parameters and risks could uh, elevate uh, that uh, chance all right so in other words to just to seal this part of the video it's oh it's already 42 uh, minutes so let's uh, this is the longest video so far so let's seal this uh, is there any longevity studies regarding uh, success rates of uh, layered prosthesis uh, there is uh, what is the maximum layering thickness acceptable or what do we mean by unsupported porcelain anything more than two millimeter of porcelain is unsupported porcelain practically speaking should we glaze or polish layered prosthesis uh, we could do either or it's easier faster and more effective to polish after uh, occlusal adjustment all right we will stop here this video and we will start monolithic uh, versus layered comparison in the next recording thank you very much